This is Scott Becker with a special episode of the Becker's Healthcare and Becker Private Equity Podcast. We're joined today by a brilliant entrepreneur, uh, a leader, uh, and now an author of a book as well, Alyssa Rapp. Alyssa, currently, she'll tell us about what she's doing, her career, where she's focused, and a lot more. Just as a as a teaser, she's now the current CEO of Empower Aesthetics. Uh, she's also the author of a book about leadership and life hacks. Uh, Alyssa, let me ask you to take it away. Tell us a bit about yourself and your career, and thank you. So, Scott, great to be back in touch. Uh, as you know from other lives, I ran a dot-com in Silicon Valley for a decade after Stanford Business School and then made my way back to Chicago with my husband from where we both originate. And once here, I ended up working with Sterling Partners on one of their healthcare companies that I ran called Surgical Solutions. That's where I first encountered, uh, of course, Becker's. And we, um, that was a successful turnaround, sold to a global strategic named Grupo Vitelmex with a private equity sponsor, uh, Australis Partners. That deal got done right before the pandemic, stayed with them a year to transition, and then ended up raising a SPAC, a Special Purpose Acquisition Corporation, which was a thing to do back in 2021, but a rough ride for the better part of two years as we looked at 113 health tech companies with which to merge and ended up choosing one and ended up announcing that deal over a year ago uh, and ended up clearing the SEC and raising requisite capital to close. And it did not consummate because the market climate wasn't what the seller wanted to IPO in, which was a bummer. But at the end of the day, I learned a ton and had been on two boards for Shore Capital for the last four years, one uh, a Together Women's Health which is an OBGYN roll-up strategy doing really well. And the second, uh, Empower Aesthetics, is a newer platform for Shore Capital. I joined, I was one of the founding board members on it. And about a year into the platform, the original CEO uh, needed to leave based, for, based on personal health and family reasons, and Shore Capital asked me to step in. So as of December 23, six months ago, I stepped not only from the board, um, but into the CEO chair of Empower Aesthetics, and that's where you find me today. Well, fantastic. And tell us what Empower Aesthetics does and, and, and where you're most focused. Tell us about that. Sure. Thank you for asking. So like many short capital platforms, we are a micro cap roll up strategy, which means we are partnering with medical aesthetics spas, med spas around the country, really focused on Texas, Tennessee and the Midwest primarily. And we have five in upstate New York. Uh, but we we are uh, rolling up medical aesthetics practices founded by wonderful entrepreneurial nurse practitioners and RNs, mostly women, but not exclusively. And we are buying and partnering with kind of middle of the fairway med spas, as we like to think. A third injectables, a third uh, a third lasers, and a third body contouring. That is the that is the typical service mix of one of our typical providers. And how much growth is there in the med spa area? And is a lot of that consumer paid for or is it is it reimbursed? What does that look like today in terms of med spa? Yeah, great question. I mean, from McKinsey to McGuire Woods to many, there's been a ton of light shined on the med spa space over the last two years by very reputable players in the space. Uh, it's a category that's really on fire from a growth standpoint for a few different reasons. First of all, it is cash pay. There's no reimbursement risk, which is obviously very attractive. Second of all, the demographic trends of consumers uh, and clients going to med spas is very favorable. Not only is it women in their 50s and up looking to preserve uh, and restore youth, but it's also uh, preventatively being used by men and women in their 30s and 40s. And then, of course, a little bit even preventatively in, in one's 20s, which we can debate the moral hazard there. But the, the good news is, is that demographic trends are on the side that the stigma around the category, I think, is really gone. And the fact is that many, I think, and I'm, I'm 45, I think many women in their 40s really think of the things you do to maintain, you know, your beauty or, or youth or good looks would be kind of hair, nails, and skin. And that's just the way of the world today for working professional women, I would argue. And so what you do in that regard with skin could be many different things. It could be just um, products topically or starting with facials, let alone anything injectable or laser resurfacing, but it's uh, the stigma is gone. So that's for many reasons why I think the category is red hot, the demographic trends are behind us, and no, there's no reimbursement risk. And uh, it's a the business that, you know, the fountain of youth is a business model, Scott, I'm sure you would agree, will probably never die. 
Well, and, and, and certainly nothing that gets more endeared to us. You're younger than I am, but you get to a certain age and this focus on physical and mental health, it takes such a big part of one's one's brain space and mind space and physical space compared to what it did when you're younger and one takes it for granted. So you do see this great growth in these areas. And your your point is so interesting on the younger people going for Botox and those kinds of things versus people my age and older doing tummy tucks and those kinds of things and just so many different ways in which people are approaching this investing so what's the limiting step is limiting step enough physicians in the area enough locations what what are the what are the limiting steps to growth i think the first step is as you already articulated access right no one you're not going to want to drive two hours to get a haircut or a hair color or a blowout you're not going to want to drive two hours to get your nails done you're certainly not going to want to drive forever in a day to get a beauty treatment uh, for your skin or body um, or medical aesthetics treatment. So that's, you know, access, which is why so many are popping up in so many places. Uh, secondly, it's of course, you know, ability and willingness to pay. The lifetime value of a medical aesthetics uh, customer depends on age and, and service mix, but it's probably at a minimum, you know, a couple thousand dollars per year into a maximum, you know, onwards of $10,000 over the life of a, of a client, if not more, they're valuable customers. So the next then limiting factor would be, can, how do you access them? How do you identify them? And geography is one way, but obviously all, all the traditional customer acquisition strategies used in consumer businesses and other, and even healthcare businesses is another. Um, and I think that the, the third limiting factor is you know access to providers and excellent clinical providers. Many RNs and NPs like those with whom we work have been working in the space for a long time, and they really are clinically the best of the best. I can say about our our wonderful seller partners. The the reality is it does take time. It's a craft. It's a skill. It involves dexterity and training. And so there's the anybody can you know who's an RN or an NP can you know hang a shingle and say they do this, but to build the reputation and credibility of of, of being a clinical provider in the medical aesthetic space that that delivers clinical excellence that's you know that's reps right that's at bats like it is for many things in life so i think that the there's a bit of a not a limiting factor in terms of the training because much more excellent training is popping up but i would say that people's ability to train and continue to be trained and continue to to get experience not all clinical providers in this category are created equal and of course, there are dermatologists and plastic surgeons who do some provide some medical aesthetic services with one level of credentials. There are also the RNs and MPs who do it all day, every day, who are very, 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 very talented and and, and experienced and seasoned at it. And then there are some newer folks to the space, uh, estheticians and, and others who you know provide aesthetic service, services that are also excellent. But I would say limiting factors would be access to great clinical providers, access to clinics, as well as uh, you know, as well as access to capital, I guess you would say, willingness to invest. Thank you very much. In terms of demographics, it seems like people at all levels of demographics are interested in these services, but how much does it skew to the, towards the top 20% of people with wealth and economics versus others, or how generally available do the med spa services become? Is there, how, how does that look oh, I, from in terms of a business you know, model? If you're, yeah, for sure. I mean, if you're an entry level aesthetics patient and client and you're going to get a, a facial for $150 and buy cleanser and moisturizers and other things to preserve, you know, the beauty and youth you already have for 20 to 40 or $50, it's very accessible, you know, middle class and up. If you're talking about the $10,000 a year of skin resurfacing or body contouring, obviously you either need a a meaningful amount of savings, meaningful amount of disposable income, or really good patient financing through charity or other platforms. But I would say upper middle class to upper class, of course, is always going to be attracted to this, but we're not talking things that are so expensive, like tummy tucks and facelifts. I mean, we're not talking twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollars. We're talking about people you can invest five hundred dollars a quarter in yourself and your, you know, neurotoxin, Botox or Discord or whatever it is to reduce and uh, eliminate fine lines in the face and that's you know that's a it's an investment but it's not necessarily a prohibitively expensive one fillers and other things can get more expensive lasers can get even more expensive but it's also an investment in yourself to the point you made about health and wellness do people bristle at a 200 dollars a month gym membership in this day and age you know maybe some not all so i would argue it's a it's an investment in self 
so in addition to being an entrepreneur and your different experiences, you also in the last couple of years authored a book. Do you mind taking a moment to tell us about that book? Oh, thanks. That's so sweet of you to ask. I did write a book. It's called Leadership and Life Hacks, Insights from a Mom, Wife, Entrepreneur, and Executive. It's obviously available on Amazon and on Audible. I got advice from one of our Chicago grades, Valerie Jarrett, to read read it myself, which is harder to do than think. Um, so the Audible, I did myself. But the uh, the book was really distilling you know, a couple decades of experience running companies and, and leading organizations into the leadership hacks of the, the book, which is two-thirds of it managing teams, managing boards, or other key stakeholders, and you know how to know when to pivot or quit in your own career. And then the back third of the book are really life hacks uh, from that insights from mom and wife part of it, where how do you layer in raising daughters, committing, you know, being a devoted wife, devoted daughter, and all the other things, and the layers and roles we all have, and any tricks of the trade that I've gained that could be helpful to others are sort of in there. And it's, it's intended to be a book that you can pick up any chapter and, and read it if it's useful to you, but you don't necessarily have to read the whole thing cover to cover. Well, fantastic. Congratulations. And tell us again, the name of the company and where we can find out more about Empower and Aesthetics. Sure. Well, Empower Aesthetics is available at empower.spa. Uh, we have um, six of our wonderful partners already and their, their clinics listed on our website with many more to come. And we'd be thrilled to hear from you. We have a newsletter that we send out from that and all those good things. So we'd be delighted to hear from you. And then on, on a personal note, because you asked about the book, Scott, I can say if you want to sign up for my personal newsletter, Hacks the Newsletter, uh, that started when I launched the book, Leadership and Life Hacks, you just go to alyssarap.com. Thank you, Alyssa, for joining the Becker's Healthcare and Becker Private Equity Podcast. It's always a great pleasure to visit with you. Such an inspiring and awesome leader. Thank you very much. No, it's a pleasure. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate the opportunity.